Uh, her pain score, NRS pain score, uh, ranged from three to seven. At the neck, uh, it was around three to five, and at the back and leg, it is about six to seven. Her pain detect tool uh, score was twelve with no diurnal variation. Her PSQ score, PSQ nine score was five, and uh, when I uh, examined, asked about uh, her psychological aspect, uh, everything was normal. But actually, because of pain, she was uh, she was thinking of quitting the job of the in the emergency department because of the nagging pain in the back and leg. Her armor score was two, fibromyalgia score was not suggestive, like WPI was four, and symptom severity score was 10. Her, her victim score was zero. Uh, in her lab investigation, she had undergone lots of blood tests uh, in the past uh, within this two years course of the disease. Uh, her, uh, almost all the tests were negative, the blood counts, ESR, CRP, which was repeatedly done through the two years course was almost negative. I have uh, uh, written down the uh, just two ESR finding and CRP, but almost all the CRP and ESR finding are like this. Uh, it's not that much elevated. Uh, apart from that, uh, her uh, in her thyroid function test, she, she had she had been diagnosed as mild subclinical hypothyroidism, but with which required no treatment with TSS 6.32. Her vitamin B12 level was 632, uh, normal. Her vitamin D was 22 in 2019, but uh, and she has been taking vitamin D ever since then, occasionally, uh, weekly and monthly basis. Her ASO titer, RA factor was non-reactive and negative. Uric acid level was uh, 4.7 milligram per deciliter. Uh, in the, radio uh, the radiological investigation that she had done uh, was almost all radiological investigation had been done before coming to me. X-ray of lumbar sacro LS spine was normal. X-ray of foot was also normal. I did the USC of plantar fascia and tarsum tunnel, which I'll be showing in the uh, coming slide, which is also normal. The MRI of lumbar LS spine was done two years back uh, when she started having leg pain and back pain uh, uh, as advised by the orthopedician. Uh, in that, uh, we can see uh, so disc bulge in the left pyramidal and foraminal disc protrusion at L5-S1 with mild compromised S1 nerve root with moderate left L5-S1 neural foraminal stenosis. MRI of SI joints were also done, which was normal. MRI of knee joint was also done, which is almost normal with uh, mild minimal knee joint effusion was there in the MRI knee. Uh, this is the sagittal and axial view of the MRI of LS spine done uh, one and a half years back. And uh, this is the T2 image uh, and the magnified T2 image I have shown in the slide. At the level of L5-S1, we can see a hyperintest zone with a left paramedian and foraminal disc protrusion with um, uh, compromised S1 uh, nerve root. Uh, this was only positive finding in that patient. Uh, this is the USG finding of the knee and ankle. Uh, this is the tarsal tunnel, right-sided tarsal tunnel with normal diameter of posterior nerve. And here we can see the left-sided tarsal tunnel with normal diameter of the uh, of the posterior nerve. And this is the USC finding in the extreme right side of the plantar fascia. Uh, the size is about 0.38 centimeter. Uh, and uh, this is the X-ray she uh, took uh, two years back, which is also normal. Uh, and the EMZ and CV test where the, the nerve conduction test had already been done a, a year back when she started having the symptom and it, it showed normal study. Uh, so uh, so I, I had a very difficult time uh, in uh, diagnosing or even finding the differential diagnosis in this case. Uh, my differential diagnosis at the time was uh, canal stenosis, spondyloarthropathy, and PIVD with the left side, uh, S1 sac, uh, radiculopathy. And uh, when I asked this, uh, when I discussed this case with Dr. Jasnu Tople, my colleague from Dardia, he suggested me that it can also be a IDD with a myofascial pain syndrome. And uh, another differential diagnosis, sensory peripheral neuropathy. Uh, so I would like uh, the expert panelist and, the, uh, and my dear Sir Gautam Das to help me regarding diagnosis of this disease, sir. Thank you. 
Hello. Um, ah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shirish. Uh, very well presented. Now, you, for the sake of the audience, uh, this is a 25-year-old lady who has come with back pain for the duration of two years. Initially, she had bilateral uh, lumbar radiculopathy sort of symptoms where she had back pain and buttock pain and pain radiating to the ankles and sole. After subsequent epidural steroid injections, which I'm assuming is a interlaminar epidural or bilateral nerve root, the buttock pain has reduced, but she still continues to have back pain and mainly bilateral leg pain, mainly around the sole. Is that correct? Yes, sir. From knee downwards, non dormitomal mainly towards the sole. Right. Uh, two or three things that I would like to clarify at this stage. Uh, any comment about the peripheral pulses? Uh, it, it was intact, sir. It was intact. Uh, I did the Doppler also of the popliteal area Doppler and uh, as well as the as a tarsal tunnel. Uh, on the examination, pulse was there and in the Doppler study, uh, the, it was a good volume with no lumen uh, problem, sir. Normal diameter. So essentially, you have almost ruled out any vascular involvement, one. Yes, sir. And also, the inflammatory markers that you have showed so far did not show any signs of any inflammatory disease. Yes, sir. Right. Okay. So can I call on the experts here? Um, can I start with uh, Dr. Pankaj here? So uh, Pankaj, uh, initially back pain. Uh, after the uh, epidural, uh, the buttock pain has gone, mainly now back pain and the pain in the leg, which Sirish is saying is non-dermatomal. What do you think is happening? So Pandit is asking me to remove the mask, so I remove the mask. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you don't get, get COVID, it's fine. <laughs> Whatever you want. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so Sirish, uh, uh, there are two uh, possibilities. One is that uh, what you are saying is that uh, she doesn't have any resting pain, right? Uh, she doesn't have resting pain, sir. In fact, the pain so subsides once she rests or lies supine, the pain subsides. Uh, but uh, when she stands and starts to walk, pain uh, increases. But yes. the claudication distance or time is same since the last two years. It is always uh, after... So when one positive finding which is there on MRI is that there is a big tear over there and uh, that high intensity zone is actually not just a HIZ. It has now been converted into a cyst form sort of thing. Uh, if you see the axial section and the sciatic section, in that you can uh, okay, you just bring that one. Yeah, so this has become it's like a cyst. If you see the sciatic section, just go close to that. Can you uh, enlarge it? Uh, I have to... Okay, no problem. No problem. So, uh, one possibility is that that when she stands or when she starts walking, this is a weaker area of the uh, annulus. And because of that, because of the pressure when she sits or when she stands or when she starts walking, that time that there may be some disc herniation and which is compressing the nerve root. Okay. Now, yeah, this is okay. This is the lower part. So one possibility is that when she starts walking, whenever she puts a the pressure, there's a big herniation which comes out from there, or maybe the cyst which is there, which is uh, coming out into the canal, and that is compressing the nerve. That is one possibility. Because this MRI is taken in the supine position, right? Uh, yes, sir. In supine position, you may find this kind of uh, uh, finding, which is not uh, uh, correlating with the patient's symptom. But this happens that when we have a, such a big tear, when the patient sits or walk, that the herniation increases in size and that starts compressing the nerve root. So that is one possibility. Other possibility is that you just mentioned something about a cervical also. That yes, sir. You started having cervical pain also, right? Yes, sir. Since and, last one year. Uh, and you said that when she reads something, that time pain aggravates, right? Yeah, yes, sir. So there is there is one condition and which is absolutely matching with the age of this patient. Uh, that is uh, basically what happens in that is a, a mismatch between the spinal canal, dura mater, and the spinal canal. There's a mismatch. So whenever the patient flexes neck, that's put a pressure on the cord. 
and the patient feel paresthesia all over the body. Okay, so there is this is a disease called uh, uh, this is uh, I'm forget a Hiram Hiramaya Hiramaya disease Hira Hiramaya disease. Although it is very very rare, very rare. I have seen such this case. I have seen this case, and typical presentation of these patients are between fifteen starts at the age of fifteen years. They start reporting, start complaining of uh, symptoms at the age of fifteen to sixteen years, around that year. Uh, the pathology behind that is there's a there's a uh, spinal canal which starts uh, developing as per the age, but dura doesn't develop according to the age. So that's why what happens there's a discrepancy between the dura. a uh, delpent and the spinal canal delpent and whenever they flex the neck typically what will happen because their dura is not extending and they start pushing the uh, uh, spinal cord over there and they start getting pain but in your case it usually it started with the lower back and started with the low, lower limb and this problem has developed since last two years on the side yes sir but actually she, actually she has been having pain for last 10 years in the back but with a mild intensity and which got relieved with a, a physio and nsaid and it was a occasional back pain every 3 4 months she used to have back pain because she is a nursing student and she thought like because of the uh, that is possible ha huh? that is possible because you know that because whenever there is a disc degeneration uh, usually that it is only the back pain back when that this um uh, there's a tear in the disc and that uh, starts bringing the radicular pain also so in my opinion i think there are two possibilities one is what i mentioned is that because when is uh, there's a big tear over there there's a cyst formation over there that must be compressing whenever she starts walking that must be compressing the nerve root and that's why she's getting this these kind of pain and another because of the cervical issues she is also having because she is a young patient 25 years old uh this is another rare possibility i am not saying this is a, this is a, but we must uh, consider that also but yeah. for that for that for that we have to have only um, possible is that we have to go for the flexion and extension mri that is the only possible uh, way to find out this um, uh, hiramaya disease in in uh, in uh, erect position sir uh in it yeah you know, it may be it may be in a in a lying position also but it has to be in a flexion no, and extension extension. position and that to mri not x ray because only in our mri we can find out that right thank you pankaj um thank you sir yeah um yeah see the pankaj told two differential diagnosis one is uh if you look at the mri probably the patient is having l5 s1 uh disc degeneration which is manifested as an annular tear you can see a high intensity zone in the sagittal film very clearly there and also there seems to be some sort of compression of the traversing nerve root at l5 s1 the compression seems to be more on the left side so possibly the left s1 which is the traversing nerve root at this level is getting compressed uh, possibility of a chemical radiculitis sort of situation is uh, probably the number one differential diagnosis um uh, i have heard of hiramaya disease before it's a type of uh, more like a cervical myelopathy sort of thing the what pankaj said about the age is true yes it does occur in um, 15 to 25 year old patients uh, it's more a sort of uh, i'm not the expert probably we'll ask dr matthew tron here it's more a type of um, uh, muscle dystrophy or muscle atrophy sort of thing not a common condition and uh, probably arthik yeah, Uh, this muscle atrophy and the uh, myelopathy features; these are the late features of that disease. Uh, yeah, I accept that. Uh, but uh, the MRI cervical, we only have a sagittal section, but uh, that looks pretty normal, right? So, yeah, the uh, dynamic study is required for that. Okay, fair enough. We'll keep this in mind. Okay, so can I call in uh, Dr. Joy Sri Subramanian, please? Uh, Joy Sri, ma'am, if you're there. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, uh, ma'am. Somebody like this. This is actually a nurse who is working in this hospital in Nepal. So there is no the typical. I mean, uh, there's no malingering or anything. So the history is quite typical. So where do we think we are going now? I think you know um, he's kind of done the testing. Um, most of the imaging is done, 
and what pankaj said was right i just was looking at these pictures of course you know i see it's a snapshot um i don't know pankaj i know his wife is a radiologist but i think he's as good a radiologist i was wondering about one of the pigs around c2 okay um uh, i know it's just a snapshot but i feel that in one of them there is a slight indentation of the cord at round c2 okay you so i was you can zoom it karthik you can zoom that uh shirish can you take that image out and yes. then zoom it for us please zoom it to yeah. uh, sir i'll try so, the cervical is not visible here you can zoom it in the powerpoint also yes sir i'll i'll uh so come out of the presentation mode come out of presentation mode and then you can zoom it and you'll have to share it again is it good enough sir no you no, have not zoomed it you have to you have to first come out of the presentation mode <clears throat> okay i'll come out from the top presentation and then in the powerpoint button you will be getting on the right hand yes. right hand side below to yes, increase sir. it yes, percentage I'll, 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 I'll pankaj i sent you a picture of that on your okay, um, okay. messenger uh okay messenger yes i got it oh yes it is there and significant it significant yes so i'm wondering <laughs> with her flexion extension of her yeah. spine of a position oh, she probably is getting some of the numb tingling could it be because of it is my question that is significant yes i have no idea yeah now you can zoom it yeah there is a plus button at the bottom right uh plus button um, right hand side right hand side at the bottom yeah right bottom side to you. yeah 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 get that image Kartik I sent it to you also. Yeah yeah it's good 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 go more go more yeah perfect 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 so it is there yes you can see that <clears throat> Oh yes yes okay it is a big yes So I personally feel that when you did the epidural you took care of some of the l5 s1 or the s1 symptoms but uh, some of the off and on numbness tingling could be related to this and maybe that's why she is also having the neck pain also yeah that is possible yeah so the the cursor is can you keep the cursor that sirish where ah uh, yeah so that's what uh, Uh, Dr. Joy, she wants you to look at. So there is a bit of compression uh, from posterior to the cord at the level of C2. Maybe this is causing a symptom suggestive of a cervical myelopathy. <clears throat> right. So uh, fantastic. All the young people missed it. The senior people picked it up with sharp vision. So that's good. Uh, can I call in uh, Dr. Matthew Tong here? He's the neurosurgeon in the group. So hey, for my glasses for a change, that's why I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dr. Matthew Tong, please, are you there, sir? This is your neurosurgery case. Dr. Das, uh, sir, have you seen these images? Do you think this can cause soul pain? Hello. Can you hear me? 
yes, if I, if I am seeing this patient, my provisional diagnosis would have been, you know, fibromyalgia. Because, you know, maybe, you know, minor problem in the MRI can be sometimes, you know, asymptomatic. Many times it, that remains asymptomatic. Because many of the features, uh, I don't know, I, can I ask series some of the questions regarding the fibromyalgia? Have you taken the history of sleep? Have you taken the history of the memory impairment? Have you taken the history of the fatigability? Yes, so what sir. About uh, her her fibromyalgia score was not suggestive, sir. Her, How uh, much was the score? Uh, it's about uh, symptom severity score was two, and uh, and uh, WPI was four, sir. And her other symptoms, her sleep and everything was normal. It, it wasn't disturbing her that much. Uh, Fatigability was not there. Her like morning uh, awakefulness uh, was. She had a good night's sleep. Also, her other other uh, uh, somatic symptoms were also not that much uh, uh, that much significant. <clears throat> right. Uh, so, uh, fibromyalgia should be should be coming at the at the, at the end. But what I want to say that uh, whenever the patient is having somebody is having the pain in the multiple areas in the cervical areas in the back non dermatomal pattern radiating to the both the legs. So one of the very important differential diagnosis should be always kept in the mind is fibromyalgia. Obviously in this case, the score, fibromyalgia score is too less. Yes, sir. Too stamp is fibromyalgia. Uh, but in these situations, fibromyalgia, spondylar arthritis, this should always be coming in the differential diagnosis. Uh, she was taking duloxetine 20 milligram BD for last uh, six months, sir. And it wasn't giving her any relief. Actually, none of the drugs like pregabalin, gabapentin, tizanidine, uh, all the drugs that we usually think of was not giving her any pain relief. Apart from that epidural, which uh, slightly relieved her uh, radiating pain in the buttock. But apart from that, none of the drugs and uh, intervention was giving her any relief, sir. Uh, the duloxetine was tried before me by a neuro, uh, neurophysician. Uh, but and I increased the dose to 30 milligram uh, BD. But like she says that um, the pain score has not uh, decreased with any of the drug. Okay, right. So we have the third differential diagnosis in the form of fibromyalgia, but again, not a typical situation we have here. Um, uh, do we have Dr. Kauser or Dr. Matthew Tong? Yes. Oh, hello. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, Dr. Kausa. Good. Yeah, good I... Dr. Matthew Tong, are you there? I've, I've been searching for you. Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Hello. So, yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Yeah, I was uh, quite interested in, uh, in what they talked about the occipital cervical junction uh, abnormality. Uh, but I think uh, a, a dynamic view of this this region would would help to to clarify the situation there, uh, inflection and extension, and sometimes a penis. But you know you have already done many blood tests to rule out an inflammatory disease, and uh, and and usually the the pathology around this area is is associated with some rheumatological condition. But I would be excited when you told me that an interlaminar injection helped her partially and that uh, I would actually uh, talk to her and say that in pain management, we are not really pain cure. We are, we are looking for the pain generator. And sometimes uh, we may have to, to try maybe a, another injection or we may try to do it uh, at the, using a more uh, expeditious route, like a transforaminal route, you see. Uh, and that would be, be uh, one of my, 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 my explorative measures, uh, you know. I think uh, that, yeah, that, that is what I would, I would think of. Thank you. Right. Um, so uh, he's suggesting uh, that uh, we have to explore the most commonest differential diagnosis, which is the L5 S1 disc herniation first. And also he's suggesting we need a dynamic imaging. So he wants a flexion and extension MRI to see if the lesion at C2 is actually causing the problem. Well, that's fair enough. So 
that's that's accepted dr shirish did you think of doing a transforaminal uh, nerve root injection like uh, s1 bilateral s1 or maybe even a lateral recess block in this patient or you just did an interlaminar epidural no sir uh, the epidural was not not done by me sir it was done 14 month back by the anesthesiologist uh, my senior anesthesiologist he uh, went uh, interlaminar actually this came case came to me 4 days back and uh, and i wanted to proceed as per the expert guidance and dr gautam das's guidelines because she is a nursing student she is already fed up with all the medicine and whatever uh, whatever uh, intervention that I, i offered has already been done so with um, the expert panelist and my colleagues gu- guidance i i wanted to proceed sir i would put this and the first uh, i would now i'll go and tell her that i would like to go go for the bilateral s1 uh, selective s1 block sir but i was actually uh, trying to get the view of the panelist before proceeding forward sir okay uh, so can i go back to dr das and ask him considering fibromyalgia is something at the back of our mind but he's already tried anti neuropathic medication but it's not worked So uh, fibromyalgia kathik i i, I uh, i am not telling this is fibromyalgia is a, is a fast you know come because fibromyalgia score is already uh, too less so we cannot you know make a uh, provisional diagnosis of fibromyalgia in this particular case so i told that this kind of presentations can be a fibromyalgia presentations so here considering all and uh, looking at the very low fibromyalgia score i will be sticking to that realist possibilities should be kept at the last in our differential diagnosis common uh, possibilities like you know uh, the annular tear what we can see obviously big annular tear and uh, now, uh, that that can cause the idd symptoms non dermatomal back pain and some you know uh, non dermatomal radiation to the leg pain this is one of the common things which might be associated with the uh, the conditions as uh, annular tear or internal disc disruption so we should be keeping that in the in the first situation and another important clue for this is your epidurals giving partial relief Uh, neck pain might be because of the pathologies what have been pointed out by the others but can be also sometimes because patient is suffering for longer time anybody suffering for the long time from any kind of pain the pain can be gradually widespread when the pain becomes chronic so gradually the pain can be widespread there are so many reasons and you know pathophysiology behind it so my first consideration should be your you know the annular uh, tear and associated with the symptoms of the chronic pain this should be the first one right uh, dr kauser uh, i would like to ask uh, 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 considering the lesion is an l5 s1 would it have been a better idea to go for a caudal in this patient uh, yes uh, kartik thank you uh, what has been discussed it's a uh, good uh, i think everything has been covered and the next series to uh, evaluate the case uh, with the maximum investigations and uh, nothing is uh, uh, remained i think he has done every possibility uh, he has tried to uh, but um, um, among all investigations only uh, the mri that is the l5s1 change is only the significant and uh, that is very much related to the symptom of the patient and uh, uh, it is uh, there is a uh, l5 uh, that is the uh, s1 root bilaterally though it is more in the left side less in the right side but still it is touching always it is touching mood uh, of the posterior annulus to the nerve uh, uh, to the s1 nerve root so uh, and the symptom is then like it is uh, and additionally the uh, he uh, she has another cyst uh, in the posterior annulus so my full concentration uh, in this case is only here fast then the remote differential diagnosis what has been uh, uh, what has been discussed uh, but what you have asked to me dr karthi uh, uh, yes uh, 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 dr chiris mentioned that uh, this 
uh, person has been treated by an anesthesiologist, usually it is posterior central laminar epidural, I think so. So this is not too much effective for this type of uh, cases. So approach should be different, but you have asked Karthik to me, it should be very selective, uh, selective S1 nerve, S1 nerve root, or by the caudal epidural, caudal epidural, but uh, uh, keep the needle, keep the needle just anterior epidural space. So if you go through the caudal epidural, you may go again to the posterior epidural, mind it. So your needle tip should be targeted to the posterior uh, anterior epidural space if you go uh, through the caudal route. So both can be done, but I am saying one is uh, a selective S1 nerve root block as well as caudal epidural keeping the tip of the needle in the anterior epidural, anterior epidural space. Thank that, you. Uh, differentiate. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kaul, sir. Nicely put. Uh, can I go back to Dr. Jayashree here and uh, ask her uh, how will she proceed now, considering most of us think it's coming from the Alpha S1 disc? Karthik, what I would add, I would have preferred a selective nerve root block or a transraminal epidural. And um, another thing that what I wanted to add to what Dr. Kausal said is many times you encounter scar tissue in the lower back and when you use a 22 gauge heart you have no control over the flow so you know the targeted drug delivery may not happen to like say l4 or l5 s1 nerve root so typically in such cases i would place a 17 gauge caudal needle and I set 17 gauge because if you have to put a 19 gauge catheter, you would need a 17 gauge needle. If you put an 18 gauge needle, which typically comes, your catheter won't go through. So you can place the needle in the caudal space, put a drop of dry, dry, make sure it is in the caudal space, then thread your catheter to if the predominant symptom is right S1, you can thread the catheter to right S1 and inject. Or in this case, keep your catheter right at the center, push some contrast, and that's how you ensure once you push the dye and you flush it with some saline, you can be sure it is going in the anterior epidemic phase. So there are two advantages to that. One, you are getting your medication as close as possible to the affected nerve root. And secondly, you don't have to use a large volume like if you did just the needle in the caudal space, okay? And if once your catheter is there, you can see, you can put a drop of contrast and see that it is going into the right S1, then redirect the catheter and do it to the left side. Or sometimes I just find put it in the center, you will see it go one or two segments above and below, anterior epidural thread is there in the lateral view, that's all you need. Right, uh, so uh, that's well taken. Uh, Pankaj, you want to add something? Okay. Yeah, so uh, in this, yeah. you see, uh, we are talking about a transforaminal. Uh, what I would suggest if this uh, patient comes to me, uh, as I mentioned, that patient doesn't have any resting pain. So yes. that indicates that that patient doesn't have much of the inflamed nerve roots, right? So in, in inflamed nerve roots, transferral works very well. Now the patient symptoms, if you go by the patient symptoms, patient complains of pain only on walking. When she, patient sits for a long time or patient when she starts walking, that means there is some compression over the nerve root which, which develops over when you put a pressure on the disc. Now, in this case, we have a clear cut evidence of big annular tear over there. So, in this case, I would like to go for the posterior annuloplasty rather than just going and repeating the transforminal or the epidurals. So, better to first take care of the annular tear. She's a young patient. All right. 
and it's been more than two years she's having radical pain and these uh, problems and you have a good evidence of big annular tear over there okay she has never so received case, transperamnel she huh? has never received transperamnel no but there is there is actually not much role of transperamnel in this case because as i mentioned patient is having pain only when she starts walking transperamnel and uh, it works very well if the patient is having resting pain where we are suspecting some inflammation of the nerve roots in those cases we expect a good results in the transferamnel now we have a evidence of the big tear over there there is a cyst over there so why not to go and go for the posterior aneuroplasty that is i think a better option she is a young patient right so uh, it's so my my uh, management plan would be go i'll go for the aneuroplasty in this case yes agreed with uh, pankaj yes boss sir uh dr das is there so what do you, what do you think uh, we should do sir go for a transperamnel first and see if it works and then proceed or straight away go for something that you would target the disc as well i i, I always feel that the you know less invasive procedure should be tried first so i will be preferring to go for the transperamnel first if it is not effective or it if it is short lived then what uh, pankaj has analyzed he has analyzed very nicely that most of the symptoms is during the standing and walking so mechanical uh, things is you not know, a very important factor thing here so uh, so correction of that by the anulopasty could be good even the endoscopic discectomy can also be tried so there are the other options but i'll be going for all those options uh, before now first i want to go for the the uh, transperamnel not working or is short lived then only i'll be going for the other things um anything else anybody want to add to this patient so uh, karthik yes? i just Dr. want to be is there you can ask novi's opinion um uh, i wanted to add one thing uh, what i do not hear repeatedly is see i think we should make it a habit to have a few lines about their uh, you know like lifestyle and social yes he did mention it is important to see if they are smoking if they have other you know habits like he did say that she doesn't um, have anything else but smoking drinking recreational drugs and what do they do for their exercise okay so i think lifestyle modification is very important in somebody who is young so i won't let this patient leave my office by just telling them i'm going to do this injection first of all i would have asked her how does she get relief from a back pain what physical therapy exercises did she do can she do any abdominal back strengthening whether you do a nucleoplasty or you do an epidural you have to address that so that the patient knows that they have a part to play which is core strengthening uh, exercises otherwise you, just by doing an injection you don't want to give the message that okay it's fine you're going to be fine so i think there should be stress upon lifestyle modification too that's all i wanted to right ma'am uh, very valid point taken very well taken uh, dr novi you are there yeah sorry we have bit i'm here okay so somebody like this back pain <sighs> radiating down we did discuss a bit about the differential diagnosis and the interventions that are possible uh is there something which we can do through first uh, as a physiatrist what lifestyle changes to <clears throat> advise to this patient first and second is what is your exercise regime for rehab for this patient yeah thank you dr karthik uh, actually dr joyshree has uh very well uh, stated about the <clears throat> rehab uh rehab prevention uh to prevent recurrence of the pain and to uh prevent uh the pain comes back too soon and too severe 
Dr. Novi, you have muted yourself. Okay, I'm back. Yeah. Yeah. So again, um, about before we proceed with the what we have uh, to do with this case, uh, the differential diagnosis must be uh, uh, sharpened first. But I agree with all of you that the first differential diagnosis is uh, either foraminal stenosis or canal stenosis that cause radiculopathy to the L4, L4, L5, and S1, uh, left and right side. And according to the history that the um, intervention is done to the L4 and M5 uh, without giving the patient intervention to the S1, uh, it is suggestable to give the patient S1 uh, block first uh, to make sure that uh, that the uh, pain only the L4 and L5. Uh, uh, doing anuloplasty, I'm I don't agree with uh, that one because I will save the disc for the last because conservative is better for the disc than we do uh, more uh, invasive treatment to the disc. So then uh, I would like to choose caudal epidural first before I proceed to transforamina or give the patient uh, the radiofrequency or even uh, needle to the disc. Uh, either anuloplasty or laser or something else. And about the uh, physical therapy, yeah, it's very important because the lady is uh, so young. Uh, one most important thing is that uh, she has to be told that the this might be the main problem. So uh, when now, She's just 25 years old, uh, and uh, we hope that she will uh, get to 70 or 80, still a long way to go, right? So it's very important to uh, preserve the disc by uh, not giving too much load to the disc by Dr. Joyce Day has already stated before, uh, doing back extension exercise, giving the core muscle of the abdomen and the back muscle strengthening exercise. Uh, there's a lot of uh, way to do it, but we must remember that uh, the protruded disc usually to the posterior lateral or uh, sometimes to the posterior side. So the extension movement, uh, the forward bending should be uh, restricted and the back extension also restricted because both movement will, uh, will precipitate uh, the disc pain. <clears throat> so then the isometric uh, movement of strengthening exercise should be given to the patient. Uh, how, to, how to show you all that? Uh, we can lay down. We can lay down uh, at our backs in supine position and then bend our both knees uh, about 90 degrees. And then uh, take, take hold of our uh, breath and push our abdomen downward. It's like scooping, uh, scooping our, our buttock up while pressing down yeah. our, you can, you can just our tell us, abdomen. Uh... Dr. Novi, just tell us the names. We'll yeah. don't, you don't have to go into this. Yeah, pelvic tilt exercise. Pel right. Pelvic so tilt exercise. It's called yeah. pelvic, yeah. Pelvic tilt exercise. Uh, but also we can uh, give the patient something uh, just similar to Kegel exercise. Do you know Kegel exercise? Uh, 
when we uh, want to hold our P, we would uh, press our anus and our uh, vagina, right? Or if you are male, uh, yeah, take hold. Yes, we all know your exercise. lower pelvic floor muscles. Yeah, do that. It will help a lot. And also, please remember to give pacing. Means that uh, she has to immediately take a rest when the symptoms comes, and it will uh, immediately uh, relieve the pain. Right. I mean, do not let her in pain in too long time. Okay. okay. Uh, one minute is too much. It's too long. So if the pain is already felt in uh, one minute time. Immediately take a rest. Supine position is uh, usually the best way, but sometimes it doesn't help. So try either uh, to the left or to the right side, lying or even in prone position. Or sometimes uh, some patients would like to have a uh, flex forward position, but uh, in long uh, in long time it's not good. And do not give the patient a brace for more than one week because then it will weaken the abdomen and the uh, back muscles in the low back pain patients. I think that's all. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Dr. Novi. So the things that she stressed about are extension exercises, core strengthening, isometric. So these are the three magic words here. And she said, avoid forward bending. Isometric. Yes, so she said, avoid forward bending. So those are the key points that she mentioned. Last uh, question before I sort of sum up this patient. Uh, Dr. Guru, are you there? Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Novi. Dr. Guru, are you there? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm here. Guru, quickly. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, quickly, in terms of lifestyle, what would you advise to this patient, typical patient in the Indian subcontinent with a disc herniation, which is causing a bit of pain in the leg, which is our most likely diagnosis. We've confirmed that with the MRI. Lifestyle changes, how will she bend forward? What sort of mattress will she use? What sort of sleeping position the patient should consider? How should she sit in, sit in the chair? So quickly, lifestyle changes for a patient with suspected disc uh, pathology. Okay, so lifestyle changes, as Gavishri ma'am told, you have to uh, stop that quit smoking and all. First thing, if she has a smoker, obviously this patient is not a smoker. Second thing, she was uh, having neck pain last one year, right? So she feels more comfortable with supine posture. Most probably, I think so. When you ask her history, she will be moving with, she will be seeing the mobile lying down on the bed. So that may be the one factor uh, that has aggravated her neck pain also. So we have to ask her whether she is using phone while lying on the bed. Okay, we have to ask her to stop it. Third thing regarding how to sit, obviously it's the ergonomic position. Everybody knows we have to support our low back. So fourth thing, how to lift up things. Actually, we should not flex our spine so as to lift. We have to bend our knees just down. You have to, uh, you have to whatever you want to lift, you have to lift both your arms. So these are the things we will say, don't strain your spine. The only word which we can say is don't strain your spine in any way. So these are the lifestyle modifications. But one thing in this case, I just want to ask, when was this MRI done? Uh, it was done uh, six months after uh, she started having pain, one and a half yeah. years back, sir, okay. by orthopedic. So I think so, this MRI, we are, you had a differential diagnosis of IDD, you had a differential diagnosis of L5-S1, then lumbar canastrosis. This is actually in a continuation of a single disease. Yes. Actually, it starts with an IDD, then it will be a protrusion. Yeah. Now I think so, better to repeat than MRI scan. So we are thinking about anuloplasty, whether we have to go for anuloplasty or not, or surgery. I think so this patient needs an M repeat MRI scan to evaluate the lumbar canastrosis. Whether there is a still inflammation is there or not, we have to need an MRI scan. Yes, of course, sir. Thank you, sir. Right. Thank you very much. Any of the other panelists I, want? Yeah. One point I wanted to add to the same lifestyle thing. See, we saw the lesion in the neck and she was getting those symptoms. Just FYI, see many patients these days, all of us work on computers. So the ideal position for the neck is a steering wheel position. 
okay but we can't keep our neck that way all the time so the simple thing that you can ask people to do is i ask them to buy one of those travel pillows okay put it around your neck if you are working like 6 to 12 hours on the computer what it does is it prevents too much flexion or extension because the pillow is in your way they can choose whichever one they want because many of the computer professionals as they keep working their neck gets so extended forward that itself causes a lot of strain especially in somebody like this okay and you can ask her to do the same when she is watching tv you know some people are used to watching tv for 2 to 3 hours maybe not you and me those are like simple things that you can tell the patient which may help with muscle spasm all that i'm saying is look guys before you start writing scripts for end say muscle relax and this and that please pay attention to simple things that may help the patient that's all thank you ma'am um so if uh, i can sum up the can i add uh, one point here yes doc- yes dr kauza yeah uh, uh my point is uh, the treatment uh, became very expensive uh, uh what uh, the series has done i think the investigations is um, uh, uh, uh more investigation uh, has been done uh he has done the mri of the si joint mri of the knee uh, ultrasonogram of the knee uh, ankle joint ultrasonogram Uh, he has done the plantar fascial injections also so uh, i think uh, it's a cost issue uh, it's a heavy burden to the patient and uh, also by the insurance uh, uh, i think uh, just uh, blood investigations and uh, after mri diagnostic uh, targeted uh, point injections if give a uh, give uh, uh, a significant pain relief then should go for the annuloplasty so you can avoid a lot of investigations i mean a lot of cost and time also the patient suffering is uh, uh, more you know, when you are spending the time also so this is uh, the uh, issues i want to add here okay thank you dr kausa uh, point taken so uh, let me sum it up so 25 year old lady with two year history of back pain buttock pain radiating pain so conservative management in terms of nsaids muscle relaxants anti neuropathic pain medication has been tried with limited success the diagnosis is confirmed by mri we talked about two other differential diagnoses in the form of uh, uh, cervical uh, myelopathy and also in terms of fibromyalgia uh, considering the most likely the overwhelming diagnosis was the uh, intervertebral disc herniation at l5 s1 which also caused uh, high intensity zone a bit of disc degeneration uh, we thought of targeting that first so conservative management has been tried lifestyle changes the panelists put pro- put forward were things like uh, bending forward and lifting weight uh, resting periodically uh, making sure she has an ergonomic chair uh, reasonably firm bed mattress sleeping position so those are the things that we discussed upon so lifestyle changes is absolutely important when we treat patients like this that's the first thing that we should be discussing this patient with in terms of interventions the first thing the panel is more or less agreed upon is go for a conservative and a less invasive uh, option first so uh, probably a transforaminal s1 nerve root injection would be the option to go in first uh the other option could be a go in for a caudal epidural injection and if this patient relieves better is doing better with this itself that should be enough after this intervention we have to teach them again remind them about the lifestyle changes and put them on the physical therapy regime the physical therapy regime we talked about our hamstring stretches extension exercises core strengthening isometric so that sort of exercise schedule the physiotherapist should be teaching this patient and she should be doing this at home every day so lifestyle changes um intervention followed by rehabilitation exercises to be done at home 
if this patient does not get relief or this patient comes back after some time we'll think of a more aggressive step which would be something that targets the disc itself we have an option of doing uh, anuloplasty there was a suggestion of doing things like an ozone discectomy and i think uh, eventually we may also the the if this uh, conservative i mean the less uh, minimally invasive procedures uh, also probably may include things like endoscopic discectomy for treating this patient so this should be the approach confirm the diagnosis have one two three as your differential diagnosis start with lifestyle changes try conservative management first with medication if they don't respond to conservative management think of basic interventions first then advanced interventions after you do the intervention and this patient has a reasonable relief strengthen the surrounding muscles around the spine by doing good rehabilitation so never forget lifestyle changes and good rehab after you do your intervention so this is going to increase the number of months or years of relief that this patient is going to get and so these patients are quite happy and uh, they usually end up having very long term relief with that so any uh, we will go on to the next patient if everybody is okay uh, thank you dr sirish excellent case presentation you almost uh, didn't leave out any material so good job dr sirish thank you sir thank you sir can i invite uh, dr archana deshpande here please is yes, she ready sir. yes uh, sir i'll just share the screen yes dr archana please sir can you see yes okay yes so should i start or full screen okay i'll do that yes okay. we are good to go uh, so okay i am dr archana deshpande from nagpur so warm wishes from the orange city uh, i am working uh, in my own pain clinic harmony and i am attached to a snehanchal pain and palliative care center and i have been ex student of uh, the radia institute and uh, rest all you can read up i can start the case <laughs> uh, okay so should i start with the history yes please yeah Uh, a 49 year uh, male 78 kg a baker by profession came with excruciating electric current like pain over uh, right uh, i just a minute i can't see the right corner of my slide just a minute how to how do i uh there is a, the images you can minimize there is a one the small slash on the left side oh yes ha huh, yeah uh over the right eye and nose and cheek pain would last for few seconds to few minutes occurring few times in a day earlier but now almost all the time he could not open his eye completely which was quite congested and watering he could not tolerate any touch over the area not even air he had covered his face almost completely with a towel he could not open his mouth wide enough to eat he used to put lignocin jelly before eating every day from inside of the mouth over oral mucosa he gave history of pain over upper lip right ala of nose earlier patient had been diagnosed as uh, trigeminal neuralgia 6 years back by a neurologist who uh, started him with uh, carbamazepine 300 uh, just i can't see the right corner still carbamazepine gabapentin both 300 mg tds with nortriptyline 10 mg tds which gave pain relief for few months when pain developed again a microvascular decompression surgery was performed by a neurosurgeon and pain reduced for a year later again uh, when the pain came back radio frequency ablation was done by a pain specialist which worked for 7 to 8 months when the pain started again the neurosurgeon performed a radio frequency ablation again which did not yield much benefit different pharmacological agents were added after that like lamotrigine paclofen terpentadol with full doses but nothing could give her uh, give him relief 
Family was in a deep financial crisis as patient could not go to work all these years. He was going in between but could not earn much. Now patient was a highly irritable person with depressed look, not willing to talk at all and with suicidal thoughts. He's, he mentioned uh, when we talked uh, with him. No other significant medical uh, past history uh, was revealed. On examination, general examination, general condition was fair, all the vitals were okay, extremely depressed look. Systemic examinations were within normal limits. On local examination, the right eye was half closed with surrounding skin slightly congested. Severe allodynia over upper and lateral border of right eye, right lateral border of nose and right alaus nose. Severe hyperalgesia over same area as above and the uh, numerical rating score was 10 and the uh, short form of the lance, the, uh, the neuropathic pain, which we say uh, was 23 out of 24. Uh, investigations were normal routine, what was done. The MRI, which was done in 2014, showed a vascular loop in close contact with right trigeminal, sorry, right trigeminal nerve should be there. Post-op CT was not done. So I, uh, I mean, there was no uh, problem with the diagnosis. Can, can we stop here? Uh, can we stop okay, here sir. and about, okay, and then sir. about the treatment okay. what you have done later on? No? Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Uh, oh, sorry. And show. Okay. What do I? Yeah, yeah. So essentially, Mm -hmm. You have a patient who had trigeminal involving V1 and V2, right? Essentially, yes. And uh, initially managed conservatively with uh, oral anti-neuropathic pain medicine, correct? Yes. And subsequently had a microvascular decompression surgery. Yes. And did not have relief and then was... He, he, she, yeah, he had relief for a year. Mm -hmm. Again, it came back. And when it came back, the pattern was similar, V1, V2? Uh, well, I have no idea, but yes, they said it was on the same area. Okay. And yeah. so the subsequent uh, two RF ablations did not give relief? First ablation do, uh, did give some relief, but not the second one. Right. Okay. And in terms of pattern of pain, did that change after uh, the surgery and uh, the RF ablation or it was? No, the, the pattern remained the same, like same electric current, like, and, you know, again, the hyperalgesia and all those things. And was there any associated uh, tingling, numbness, uh, other neural yes. signs? Tingling was there and sometimes numbness. He's, he did mention sometimes numbness. Right. And Archana, can I, Archana, can I ask you, uh, Kartik, or I want to ask one question to Archana. Uh, Archana, yes. you have mentioned that you know there is there is nasal congestions, conjunctival congestions. So was it there from the beginning or it developed later on? No, um, it, yeah, on the first visit when he uh, visited me for the first time, this was there. No. They were in very bad shape. No, I understand. I understand. When you are there, you have clearly mentioned that uh, you know. There is congestions and there is watering of the eyes. And I'm asking, was it there at the beginning of the symptoms? Yeah. I mean, six year um, back. Six, six year, year back. back uh, congestion of the eye. Uh, um, specifically, I did not ask. But the pain area and the pain pattern was same six years back. I understand. But because this is, these are you know, indicating the sympathetic involvement, you know. So yeah. I was asking whether... It was there at the beginning or it developed later on? Uh, that, you, that, that, was, that was not clear. Probably that uh, was not clear. That I, specifically, I did not ask that uh, this congestion part was there in the beginning. Yes. But uh, they kept on telling me that it happens that this watering starts very often, but it, it just can happen that I did not ask them six years back, was it there? I did not ask specifically. Okay, so just for the juniors to know why why exactly we are asking this is mm -hmm. somebody with pain around the eyes with watering and uh, watering of the eyes and nose uh, maybe associated red, uh, redness could think of things like cluster headache, right? So that's why we are asking. So mm -hmm. 
peri orbital pain uh, with watering of the eyes and such su- signs suggestive of sympathetic involvement could be a cluster headache and we could have gone along the wrong way throughout but again mm-hmm. you did uh, mention that there was neurovascular compression in the mri you mean the initial mri yeah initial mri it was there yeah and also uh, uh, that, not only that kartik not only that kartik trigeminal ganglion ablation first time gave very good result of very good relief that's right yeah pain. yeah it gave relief that that cannot happen if it is a faster headache yeah if it is a faster headache that you know, that ablation cannot give relief yeah and on also there is an entity like i think somebody has pointed it out also trigeminal autonomic cephalgia mm right can okay. we cons- can we consider uh, sir it's an trigeminal neuropathy or deafferentation of the pain hello yes palak uh, you are directing this question to yeah dr das sir okay that was that was what i was asking i was thinking like that that maybe maybe I, I, this is an assumption because the history was not very clear that maybe at the beginning when the patient presented it was a typical you know trigeminal neuralgia uh, without any watering without any you know about the sympathetic involvement but after the repeated ablation the deafferentation and pain and the sympathetic nerve involvement maybe later on these congestions have developed later on because of the sympathetic involvement that is a possibility that is, that uh, that's why i asked this question whether it was there or not so in that situation we might be you know thinking that you know repeated ablation particularly repeated rf ablation can mm-hmm. create that situation deafferentation pain you know the mm-hmm. which we call the anesthesia dolorosa so patient mm-hmm. will be having typical neuropathic pain on the touching uh, electric shock uh, means you know neuropathic pain you know when touching mm-hmm. allodynia and all other things might be present so uh, but sir is- wouldn't wouldn't that remain i'm sorry Sh- should i i should i speak on yes yes Yes, uh, wouldn't that be uh, uh, if it had been a deafferentation then it would have remained there for uh, i mean continuously isn't it right right that that it is more or less continuous and ah, uh, trigeminal neuralgia have... pain and the deafferentation pain one of the very important differentiating point is trigeminal neuralgia pain is comes in spike and remains ah. pain free for certain period of time and then again the one another spike comes but in the deafferentation pain Uh, particularly after the rf ablations it remains more or less baseline pain will be always there huh. so uh, baseline pain is here in your case or not no sir he had pain free some uh, periods in between right right, right. that pain free so period gradually reduced any other things right huh. but again in trigeminal neuralgia typical trigeminal neuralgia there should not be congestion there should not be watering that is one mm-hmm. of the thing which is not going in favor of the trigeminal neuralgia it can be you know any of the other type of the autonomic cephalgia Yes, sir. I agree. I was also wondering that I mean, why he has congestion, but that's wrong. Right. Can I uh, call the neurosurgeon here, uh, Dr. Matthew Tong? Uh, Post microvascular decompression of trigeminal patients having pain. Dr. Matthew Tong. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, okay. Uh, I suppose the uh, technical aspects of uh, microvascular decompression can be discussed. You know, all of us when we do uh, microvascular decompression, we not only uh, address the vascular component. Of course, that's very important. The dorsal root entry zone into the to the pons uh, must be must be clear. visualized and any vascular loop held away using using a teflon sponge these things should be re-explored upon a uh, recurrence and uh, they have reports that uh, a, a repeat uh, mvd can be uh, can be effective uh, then uh, other aspects would be we we not only address the vascular loop we also rub the the trigeminal nerve which tells you that we are not really sure whether it is a vascular problem or whether it is prob- uh, a, a neuropathic problem. That's why we, we add some mechanical trauma to the nerve to, to help the, the relief. Then, uh, of course, I, I, I'm interested to know that is uh, not 
Tin, part of the tricyclic antidepressant group, uh, is it really for? And uh, uh, this is all I, I, I think I would think of, like, you know, in, in terms of MVD. Uh, yeah, thanks. Kartik, can I uh, ask one question for, uh, to explain Gautam Dar said one point here. Um, how do you explain uh, the dropping of the upper eyelid, half drop or full drop, uh, having in the history, it's a mortal loss actually. So how do you explain uh, why it has been happened? Uh, I should have another cause? Yeah, yeah Dr. Kausar, we are coming to that. I have that in my mind, so we'll, we'll come to that. So, uh, Dr. Matthew Tong, uh, why why exactly does after the surgery? I I, I just want this uh, clarification from you as a surgeon. Why do you think this? Uh, I you told the technicalities of the surgery that you sort of separate the blood vessel, which is uh, close to the nerve root, and you also put a Teflon patch. Uh, what happens even when there is a failure of a microvascular decompression surgery? What technically happens there? You, you, are, you are, are you asking me regarding why it recurs? Yes, it? yes, 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 yes. Oh. Yeah, uh, the vascular loop uh, is is ectatic because of uh, of uh, degeneration. It becomes more and more ectatic. It may actually elongate, and the 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 Teflon sponge may not uh, may may have lost its efficacy in in keeping the vascular loop from banging against the the nerve. So a re-imaging can, can also tell you if this has indeed occurred and that you can actually address it again. Okay, right. Thank you. Thank you. Sometimes the technical, technical problem uh, re-occurs because of uh, the vascular loop. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, can I go back to Dr. Archana and ask her, um, this is the point about motor weakness. I think uh, somewhere in the history we talked about some something like ptosis, right? Why why do you think that happened? Ptosis. Uh, something like a motor weakness in the face, right? Uh, no, sir. Uh, in the upper eyelid dropping. Up, yeah, upper eyelid dropping. Uh, somewhere in the case. Right? Uh, upper eyelid dropping is not always because of the motor weakness. There might be the other other reasons also. Like in Horner's, there is no Horner's syndrome. There is no motor motor weakness. Oh. Uh, Dr. Archana, why do you actually, think actually, this, hmm. this happened? Yes, sir. Uh, why do you think this upper eyelid uh, happened? Uh, as far as my uh, history, the, it doesn't mention any motor weakness, sir. No, I, I, I remember seeing this upper eyelid uh, weakness in the case. Uh, that's what Dr. Kauser is asking as well. Uh, let me check. Examination. Uh, right eye closed with surrounding. Right oh. eye half closed. Is suggestive uh -huh, yeah, okay. Half closed is actually he was, uh, I mean, it was not that he was unable to open his eye. Uh, he just did not want to open his eye. That was the thing. Because of pain. His eye. Yeah, he could open his eye. I and mean, it wasn't a motor weakness, sir. Okay, right. Okay. Uh, can I can I go back to Pankaj now and ask him, post MVD, two RF ablations, what is there in his mind? Somebody with uh, this history. Pankaj. Pankaj is not there. Uh, can I call Dr. Jayashree here, please? Yes, Karthik. Post MVD, two hour of ablation, pain persisting. Ma'am, what do you think? Um, you know, um, patients already taking the other medications that she has listed, baclofen, tapentadol, lamotrigine. See, one also has to remember that sometimes post-radio frequency in 10% of patients, the radio frequency itself, you can cause some burning pain, okay? And then um, uh, 
whether you do radio frequency, mostly you get the highest success rate with Janetta's procedure, but if the patient pain recurs, we do the radio frequency. You remember, all of you know, like even though we turn on the needles different directions to get all the branches and stuff, you are not seeing, actually seeing the needle. You just stimulate, you do the lesion, and sometimes patient can still have residual pain. That is the truth. And if some time has passed, then these nerves kind of regenerate or like doctor, the neurosurgeon was mentioning, there may be regrowth of the vessels which causes recurrence of the symptoms. That's all I can say. I can't think of anything else that we could do at this stage. Right. Um, uh, Dr. Archana, do you think it may be a good idea that uh, we sort of do a repeat scan, repeat MRI. Did MRI. You, yeah, did you consider that before proceeding with the treatment? Uh, well, uh, in the first phase, yeah, uh, I did not consider it because, uh, I mean, because I thought the diagnosis is already made and somehow the patient was in a very bad shape, like he was in a financial crisis. So making him do, uh, I, I just wanted to make him a little bit pain free first and uh, probably again then go for something which if this does not work, that's, I mean, if they were really not in a shape to spend money at that time. And okay. uh, I mean, okay. I, it, it didn't occur to me, sir. Fair enough. This, uh, what I, exactly? Karthik, I just yeah. wanted to add one thing. See, I haven't done it personally, but some of my neurology colleagues have done. Instead of doing something such invasive, some people inject Botox, okay? And it has worked at least temporarily. That's one thing. Uh, second, I know Dr. Vaas has done dry needling for this type of lesions and has had great success. Though I'm kind of, you know, convinced that sometimes with chronic pain, you have to keep an open mind if I were the patient and I'm thinking one more radio frequency or one more surgery, I would say, hey, why not try dry needling or the Botox, which is less invasive? Okay, that's all I wanted to add. Right. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you, ma'am. So, Archana, going coming back to you, what okay. did you? was the at, the at the stage when you saw the patient after the RF, both the RFs and the surgery, what did you think was going wrong? What was your diagnosis at mind before you started your intervention? Uh, well, actually, uh, as we all know that radio frequency uh, ablation, um, I mean, there is a limitation to its pain, uh, dura pain relief duration. So I thought uh, it has... Um, probably not, I mean, not given to all, both the uh, branches like V1 and V2. So probably uh, only V2 has been, you know, uh, addressed and V1 is not addressed. That may be the reason or uh, maybe it has just come back due to, I mean, short, I mean, it, it can happen that the radio frequency ablation can work for a small uh, period of time. So, uh, okay. Can I put the question to Dr. Das? Post MVD, do you think the radio frequency ablations are not as successful as before surgery? Because we have a patient here where we have not repeated the scan. So, uh, you know, uh, first was microscular decompression. Second was that was successful for around seven eight months as per the history. Then the next RF was successful for around one year, and the third RF was not at all successful. This was the three important major inv uh, invasive procedure. So. Uh, According to me, the diagnosis in this stage uh, is basically is your kind of deafferentation pain of repeated, you know, the, this procedure. And uh, that also can, you know, tell the symptoms, sympathetic involvement. So all these things can be, you know, uh, the explaining uh, the possibility of the, uh, of the deafferentation pain and the anesthesia dolorosa kind of thing. So where the sympathetic involvement is very clear by the, uh, the 
the conjunctival congestions. So, uh, in my opinion, this case should be taken in uh, that way. Means it's a it's a uh, trigeminal neuralgia, and uh, the uh, deferences and pain and sympathetic involvement later on. So, uh, the in my uh, the if if I am asked to do hot procedures, definitely another neuroablative procedures I am not going to prefer. Hot, as uh, was telling, uh, we also have the similar kind of experience that the dry needling can be very, very successful in these situations. We have done few cases, uh, particularly in the young patient. I can remember there was a patient of only 18 years of age. Uh, we presented that case also in the last conference. And uh, we thought that at this age uh, of trigeminal neuralgia, which is very rare at this age, and uh, if we are going to ablate it, one ablation might be giving around five years maximum pain relief, five to 10 years maximum if you're thinking, then how many times in the whole life we are going to ablate? And repeated ablations can be having its own you know, disadvantage and difficulties. So let us try dye needling. And it worked very nicely. So uh, that was uh, uh, in these situations also, I'll be thinking in that line. But let us see how, how Orchama managed this case. Sir, Kartik. Yes, yes, please. So recently, I also had the same kind of patient who had, like this patient had undergone for two time radiofrequency procedure, one time uh, microvascular decompression. Just uh, 15 days back, I had one patient who had been gone for uh, microvascular decompression, four time radiofrequency procedure, one time gamma knife radiation that has been done at the Bangalore. And still, he was only 33 year old and he had the same kind of pain, but it was continuous dull aching pain in between there were spikes, but definitely there were no autonomic uh, symptoms were there. There was no congestion and because of this repeated procedure, he had developed uh, dryness of the cornea and because of that he had developed keratitis and we lost uh, vision in that eye. So mm -hmm. there was corneal dryness and uh, that was there. So uh, let us see how doc Dr. Rachna has managed this case. I would uh, yes. like to give my feedback that how I had managed that case. And um, patient had a good, good pain relief after that, but since it is only 15 days. Mm -hmm. So as I had gone through the presentation, it was around uh, Dr. Rachna is having follow-up of more than six months, I guess. Yes. Yes. So uh, it's uh, difficult for me to comment. Uh, I don't have that much follow up. So let us go. She has managed it very, ni very nicely. Uh, actually, uh, yeah, Kartik sir asked me uh, why I didn't think of MRI now. Because uh, sh the patient said we don't want to do any procedure which will cost us more than 3,000 or 2,000 rupees. No surgery, no radio ablation again. Because I thought I will talk to the people uh, who have done this and we'll uh, do it again. That's what my first thought. And then MRI was there in, in the mind at that time particularly. But then when she refused to spend, she cannot spend, she said, then I just, uh, you know, uh, deleted that thought that, okay, now I have to give him, give her pain relief with, uh, you know, whatever is possible in the clinic on OPD basis. And dry needling, yes, I thought about it. But because of the COVID situations, that time, um, it was in March when he came. So I cannot call her. I could not call him again and again for this. So I uh, ruled out COVID, uh, ruled out dry needling, but that was there in my mind. I. Uh, what I about uh, doing this uh, diagnostic transnasal uh, sphenopalatine ganglion block with 10% lidocaine? I mean, that is again minimal invasive. Yes. Or, uh... mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, you can try that. I also wanted to add, I just remembered Mm -hmm. to uh, totally, uh, you know, this may be not feasible in all directions. I just wanted to tell you that way back in 2003, 2004, the, he's, I think right now in Stanford, his name is the neurosurgeon by the name Jamie Henderson. Mm -hmm. So he did a series of uh, stimulator leads against the trigeminal, for trigeminal neuralgia. Mm -hmm. And I distinctly remember this conversation where at that time, we don't have the kind of leads that we have right now. So um, here, I think it was a series of six or eight cases. The biggest problem with those stimulator leads was they always migrate, okay? Mm -hmm. 
coming fast forward, I haven't seen or followed what he has done recently. Fast forward, I just was looking at some of these uh, tiny pet nerve stimulators. So, Anuraja, are they? Okay. They are ready to come here. I think that may be an option going forward. These are much simpler than the regular spinal cord stimulator, very small leads, but we'll have to wait and see how these little leads evolve. It may be ongoing studies in the next six months or a year. So that would be another option. I just thought I would add that to when you said that many things have been tried and failed. I also wanted to say that spinal cord stimulator leads, the regular quad leads, the main thing is it migrates. We'll have to see in the current availability of, you know, like tiny contact point leads, how well they would work and can we place them effectively will have to be studied. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, since we can't afford a MRI, we definitely cannot afford a spinal cord stimulator. <laughs> So we can forget about that. <laughs> yes, sir. So, uh, uh, Dr. Archana, you think there is a role for uh, somebody in the comment section has also put it. Diagnostic spinopalatine ganglion block. Uh, yes. Uh, now that I feel retrospectively, but that time I... Um, go ahead. Yes. Go yeah, ahead with the way it. you you manage the patient, please. Okay. Uh, okay. I put it again on the slideshow. Please. So uh, what I did was I did a right supra, sorry, right supratrochlear nerve block uh, by anatomical landmark in my OPD uh, with a uh, one cc of 1% lignocaine and it yielded some pain relief. So I gave, uh, proceeded with uh, methylprednisolone with that. And I gave uh, right inferior alveolar diagnostic block also similar way. And uh, then I observed the patient for some time and then discharged with uh, oral carbamazepine he was already on and gabapentin and one thing I wanted to, to add because he was in agony and had suicidal thoughts so I had kind of you know anxiety that I should be giving him good pain relief at least 50 to 70 percent so that he comes to me again and talks to me more and we can do much better for his pain relief so I started with him morphine SR and I was hesitant, so I asked my senior colleagues whether I can start such thing. And I read some, uh, you know, um, <laughs> guidelines uh, on the uh, internet immediately. And uh, yes, it was a really, it was uh, there in the guidelines. So I started with morphine, seven point five milligram SRBD, and SOS paracetamol. And uh, when I just uh, actually uh, discharged from the OPD, his immediate NRS was six by ten. So that was something which uh, gave me a little. Uh, courage and after should I go ahead or yes yes go ahead uh, so after one week uh, when uh, they came back uh, the NRS was three uh, over all the previously painful part pain was there on touch but only on touch not with air or something now there's no redness no congestion of eye with full opening uh, he was uh, and hyperalgesia allodynia had reduced in intensity Lance was 15 Patient could open mouth before uh, for eating than before and did not apply uh, jelly or anything before uh, eating or something. Uh, he was looking better with less irritability, but still had few symptoms. Some, I mean, the frequency was there. Uh, some electric current like pain was still coming to him. Uh, no PCM was taken in that uh, week and the oral medication was continued. Then after four weeks, the pain had further reduced. Uh, the frequency of pain attacks had reduced to uh, once a day at the most. He was eating well, looked very good, smiling. Now he, were, he was in a position to converse with me, uh, not covering his face anymore, no allodynia, hyperalgesia, Lance was just eight. He was back to work. He had started attending his bakery for one or two hours uh, in a day. Uh, PCM was taken only once. Uh, medication, then I thought of reducing the medication uh, to uh, carbamazepine and gabapentine to 200 milligram TDS and morphine I continued. After eight weeks, uh, the NRS was still uh, very good. I mean, less uh, Lance had reduced further. Uh, frequency of pain was reduced once in few days now. 
no fresh complaints were added uh paracet and the drugs were conti uh, drugs were continued at a lower dose 100 mg tds uh, i thought of uh, discontinuing morphine at this time and uh, i uh, thought uh, i mean um, i wanted to follow him up without the morphine but the frequency after 10 weeks increased again and even the allodynia hyperalgesia appeared again lance became 12 and i just um readjusted the doses and uh, here at this point of time of time methadone actually i thought of adding methadone uh, uh, at the first um, uh, i mean at first only but methadone was not available that time so i added oh, morphine okay. methadone i started at uh, 2.5 mg because i had read uh, i mean neuropathic uh, it is better opioid for neuropathic pain so i did that and then at 14 weeks uh, the nrs remained uh, okay again it came back again and frequency reduced to once in few days uh, s i mean the lance was six and the same medications continued but at 20 weeks there was some pain at the right upper lip and nearby area and nasal ale so that time i mean it was typical of uh, maxillary uh, v2 uh, area not v1 anymore Uh, and nrs had gone little gone high up to 5 by 10 and the s lance was 16 so i thought of giving maxillary nerve block and uh, did the same uh, as we do peripheral uh, maxillary nerve block and the pharmacological treatment continued then when i saw him at uh, 24 weeks um, everything looked fine nrs 1 to 3 uh, s lance 6 no allodynia hyperalgesia and i continued the medications it's just one week that i have seen him that's it right uh, so the pain that they did not respond to surgery and two rf ablations responded to <laughs> i don't know sir i mean it's the experts now they can guide me <laughs> what <laughs> right hello can i ask some yeah yeah um you see i heard i heard that the presenter did a injection of the super trochlear and the inferior alveolar nerve the inferior alveolar nerve is a branch of mandibular nerve so but yes, the thing is the presentation is is that a mandibular nerve and what is the this how did you make the decision to 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 that, luckily you know you did well you succeeded but why did you go for a, a branch of the five the third division uh yes sir thank I, you i yeah i did thought about of it it is a branch but actually um um uh, what i said i mean the in the peripheral uh, when he was uh, showing me the area no sir so in the area uh, there was some uh, area of uh, right lateral border of nose right tally of nose and there was some uh, at i mean he was not able to show a little on the lower side of the lip also he was showing but i did not consider it here little lower of the side so i thought maybe uh, it's it's a it's a what you say um kind of i did diagnostic whether it works or not i didn't know so i did a diagnostic and then did i it did occur to me that whether it will work or not i let me see <laughs> why not uh, the infraorbital yeah infraorbital should have been given even uh, somebody, uh, i think uh, yeah infraorbital should have been tried yes okay anyway ultimately our patient got very good relief so mm -hmm. we have to think how what, what can be the mechanism of action so why the patient was having that you know fantastic relief uh right uh, see uh, do dr rachna has thrown up a few interesting things here one is um, she didn't do anything high fi she didn't do neurolytic she didn't do rf ablation she didn't do stimulators she did something pretty simple uh, she did uh, local anesthetic with steroid blocks and then gradually waited it out for the patient to become better one luckily for her it worked out Yes, second sir. <laughs> is uh, the interesting thing about uh, starting morphine for a non malignant cause which is uh, 
probably in your case, uh, if you ask my personal opinion, it is justified uh, in a small dose, probably 7.5 is hardly a dose which uh, we, we are accustomed to, or at least personally, I'm accustomed to 200, 300 milligrams of morphine a day. So 7.5 milligram SR shouldn't be too much of a problem. Um, so yes, interesting approach. Luckily it worked out. Uh, what I want uh, the panelists to uh, throw light on is something like this happens. Algorithm wise, what would they think of? So probably the one thing that they, we discussed is to do a diagnostic sphenopalatin ganglion block. We talked about deafferentation pain. We talked about anesthesia dolorosa. So can I ask uh, uh, Dr. Guru here, uh, if he thought it was more of a anesthesia dolorosa, how would he confirm the diagnosis and how would he manage? After this is uh, considering that at the, before Dr. Rachna started the treatment, I'm going to ask Dr. Guru what he thinks about anesthesia dolorosa in this patient. Anesthesia dolorosa, obviously this patient is not having any numbness. Obviously we are ruling out anesthesia dolorosa. Symptom is he don't have any numbness, right? No. Mm. no. So obviously the diagnosis is excluded. So it may be neuritis. Obviously, it can, if there is no numbness, most probably it is favorable of neuritis, not of neuropathy. Right? You are asking me, Dr. Guru? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So actually, if the patient don't have numbness, still she is having pain. Uh, Actually, I am not in favor of anesthesia dolorosa in this case. But still, if the patient has a numbness, then I can think about anesthesia dolorosa. There, I will. Can I continue? Uh, uh, we'll guru? Have, we'll have to mute everybody again and then unmute Guru. Sir, can you mute everybody again? Can I continue? Okay, sir? I have muted everybody. So okay. now my Guru and you can unmute. Yes. Okay. This patient has got no numbness. So obviously the anesthesia dolorosa is ruled out. But if the patient, actually we are coming out of this case, if the patient has got numbness, so then we can think about anesthesia dolorosa. That too, the procedure was done six, um, one, almost some months back. And expecting anesthesia dolorosa later is not going to be a, a continuum of the procedure. It may be some other. Uh, some other pathology will may be causing the symptom. So obviously we have to rule out any mass compressing the trigeminal nerve. So if you're having patient with numbness after some months of procedure, then we have to rule out the other causes, not directly related to the procedure. Okay, so you don't think it's anesthesia dolorosa? So no, you're obviously saying this case is not a case of anesthesia dolorosa. And one more thing, the particular thing for this patient, I felt like the patient had undergone uh, or of ablation by a pain specialist on the first sitting. So the patient had a symptom of V1 and V2. The question rises, what the pain physician did for V1? Whether he had did some procedure there or he didn't touch up. So if he had touched, then what was the temperature he kept? Uh, Dr. Arshana, do you have any information on that? You have to unmute yourself. <laughs> Uh, no, sir, I did not get the, uh, even I thought the same thing like V1 is not, uh, maybe the V1 is not uh, done, I think, but I could not get the uh, details of his RF uh, procedure. Second, it was done by a neurosurgeon. I always counter check what he had done. I can even still believe my pain physician, but I will ask what the neurosurgeon had done. I had to confirm, second confirm it with him. Because mm -hmm. uh, we had to, because he had redid the procedure that has not given any relief. So mm -hmm. I we have more favorable of technical failure. Mm. So, Even I, yeah. so I will think about a technical failure. I, it's not in a wrong thing to discuss with the surgeon. So I will okay. think of it. Now okay. the patient has got sympathetic activities. You had told there was autonomic involvement. So the, my thing is, I before you had managed in a nice way. This is also the way I do for my patients. The best thing okay. is for me, if I'm having a case like this, if a patient is having autonomic also, I will go for a diagnostic block. Okay. I think Karthik is going to continue the stepwise approach later, right? Right, fair enough. So 
um one thing that uh, guru has thrown up which i was interested in is technical failure of the previous procedures mm -hmm. so yes uh, probably if this was me and uh, and uh, we were in a situation like that two are of ablations but not a great result i would have definitely considered one a diagnostic procedure of the sphenopalatine i would have mm -hmm. probably also considered a diagnostic procedure of the trigeminal itself that 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 again you can repeat and see before you do the uh, that's something that uh, just for the sake What? of discussion it's something that you would consider diagnostic uh, okay so diagnostic spinopalatine ganglion block to see mm -hmm. if this was a sympathetic origin okay. would be something that mm -hmm. we could have considered if this okay. patient had good relief for the sympathetic considering there is watering of the eyes and stuff so it's something that may be worthwhile pursuing second is um, diagnostic uh, trigeminal itself that's again something that i would consider and mm -hmm. again uh, we were handicapped because we couldn't repeat the imaging in the your patient mm. so that's uh, something right so yeah ca can conservative management like what you tried basic stuff uh, supra orbital infra orbital inferior alveolar or all peripheral nerve blocks yes they do work uh, especially when we are talking about v1 distribution when you don't want to do a v1 rf ablation supra orbital infra orbital is something that 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 gives pretty good relief so if you are not very fond of doing v1 rf ablation yes uh, supra orbital uh, either uh, local with steroid blocks a neurolytic blocks are of ablation so yes, all of them can be tried kartik um hello uh, i'm going to throw this to yeah uh, to dr joy shri here this question uh, do you think uh, it is justified to start morphin in a non malignant situation considering this case dr joy shri you have to unmute yourself man Oh, can I ask that to Dr. Das if he's there? Hey, what was the question again? Can we start uh, strong opioids in non-malignant situation like this, morphine? See, in this situation, what I would have preferred, and she did say that she had no access to methadone. My drug of choice would have been methadone, five milligrams, three times a day. if you put everything in context that the patient has had a surgery patient has had two rf other medications have been tried patient is not in a situation where he can afford more and more the cheapest medication is methadone and as you all know because of its both being an opioid receptor agonist and an nmda receptor action of it i would have gone with methadone and she is absolutely not wrong in trying a low dose morphine considering you wanted the patient to have some relief some semblance of life there is nothing wrong in giving opioids okay and as you know i come from a country where people would um write opioids for if their toenail hurts so this situation absolutely yes right um any of the other panelists would like to contribute here in terms of difference in approach what she did was very simple and very basic luckily it worked out so we are okay with that uh, in terms of um, approach any of the other panelists would like to contribute anything else here or i'm going to wind it down kartik i just want to ask why she tried supra trochier so is it a technical thing or something he she missed supra orbital no oh, it's the same i think she meant supra trochlear and supra orbital both yeah yeah that's right <laughs> sorry okay one, um, more, one more thing i just want to ask uh, is it 7.5 mg morphine sr available in india uh, no sir it's not available it's 30 mg tablet okay. but i because i didn't want to start uh, him on a okay. a bigger dose hmm. i and i was quite okay. i mean because his nrs in the opd was 
Okay. So I believe that it will work for some uh, more time, definitely. So that's why I made it four parts of that tablet. So that is 7.5. Okay. Uh, <laughs> let me add something here with extended release formulations of morphine. Yes, yeah, I know. Yes, it doesn't work. <laughs> you cannot score those tablets because it is not effective at all. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I realized it later on, but it worked. And so I continued. I realized it later on after the I prescribed it. But yes, I do agree. Yeah. Yeah. Is methadone nowadays available in India? We have we shortly have, we have some shortage over the last few months. Is it available now? Yeah, it's available. Very nicely available. Very well available. Karthik, is it available? Uh, it is available, Guru. Okay, ma'am. Even the one more, one more point I wanted to add for people, you know, who use ultrasound. See, with the availability of ultrasound, you can use the ultrasound to do your supraorbital, maxillary, mandibular, supratrochlear nerves. So if you are thinking that it is not the ophthalmic division, and you don't want to put a needle in the brainstem or close to the trigeminal ganglion, you can try the peripheral blocks with ultrasound guidance. Yeah, yes. yeah. so that is one option, yes. And the final question, again, I'm going to ask Dr. Jayashree, ma'am, if this was a situation where it did not respond to anything and you had a situation where the affordability was not an issue, how would she go about with her stimulation in terms of trial and lead placement? So, like I mentioned to you earlier, the quad lead is what you would try. And some people, what they have tried is just placed it as high as possible and to the side affected. But uh, when it comes to permanent placement, it is usually a neurosurgical procedure when it is done, okay? Because the chance of lead migration is very high. Even when you uh, place it properly neurosurgically, still lead migration is a problem. Now, if you ask me in the current setting, like we have, um, there are three different peripheral nerve stimulators that are available. There is one which is designed right now, what the trials are going on is, it's like a little point, okay? And you don't need and the theory is even when they have tried it out in femoral nerve, uh, suprascapular nerve, and you just hook it up to a little battery outside, there is no major implant. And the theory behind it is after 90 days, they have been able to remove that little point lead and there is sustained pain relief, which has been noted for nine months. So it's not really permanent, permanent, and it is very easy. It's like a little, little point. So I would wait and see, and I'll have to talk to some of my colleagues to see if we can try this or somebody has tried it in trigeminal. So that seemed very exciting to me that one, you don't have to implant a battery. And it is such a simple procedure at least for peripheral nerves that you can do it with ultrasound or you can do it with fluoro and they give you the needle comes with a nerve stimulator. So you attach it to the stimulator, you watch the stimulation and then you just deploy this lead under ultrasound. Now, needless to say, this is close to the uh, trigeminal ganglion. So that's why I'm adding caution to it. It is something that we'll have to wait and see if this can be done. And because it is designed just for peripheral nerve, you worry about the amplitude or, you know, the patient could turn it up, shock themselves if you put a spinal cord stimulator lead because of the way it is designed. This one has very low amplitude. So we'll have to wait and see. That would be my choice. Right. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, the final question before we wind up is to Dr. Matthew Tong. Somebody like this, refractory pain, you've done a surgery, you've done two RF ablations, not working. As a neurosurgeon, is there a role for doing repeat trigeminal surgery? Dr. Matthew Tong. 
Yeah. Yes. Um, provided you have imaging, which tells you that uh, there is evidence of uh, persistent vascular compression, then of course. So if again, however, if you if you don't see any vessels, then uh, going in such an invasive procedure for 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 uncertain gains uh, probably not worth it. You know. So you are saying if the imaging shows uh, the repeat imaging shows vascular uh, compression, it's worthwhile doing a repeat surgery. Yes. Okay, thank you, Dr. Matthew. Thank you. So yes, um, if there is anything else the panelists want to tell the uh, delegates. Yeah, and the other thing is... Yes, Dr. Matthew. Yeah, as you know, the, 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 the MRI sequence you, you need for the trigeminal nerve... Uh, Imaging in the system, uh, constructive interference in steady state, CISS. You got that. I think uh, it's well known by the oncologist. Thank you. Okay, I didn't get that last part there. Right. Okay. Can, Any can, I, can, yeah, I, can, I, can I just ask you that, okay, uh, just how, if we are thinking uh, that uh, Orchana managed the case very nicely, beautifully, uh, but uh, how did it really work? And the uh, majority will be agreeing that with the point that majority pain physicians, if they are getting this patient, uh, should be going with a diagnostic spinopalate and ganglion block. I feel majority will be doing that because you know sympathetic involvement is obvious and uh, that should be the first choice. But the way he see, managed it very nice, uh, congratulations for that. But if you are thinking retrospectively, I'll be asking to see one of the very important thing that you see, initially when he has given, she has given the block, initially the pain on that day was reduced a little bit, uh, partially 50% around, and then gradually pain went, you know, went on reducing. After around eight weeks, means two months, the pain again started increasing. Uh, isn't it, Archana? And then again, he, he started at that point of time methadone, and then again, patient was having the good relief. So if you are looking about it, you know, it, you know, matches with the duration of the pharmacological action of steroid. That means uh, he, he has given you know uh, the deposteroid. So deposteroid, you know that it is effective something around around uh, two months, sometimes around three months. That means it actually the steroid probably worked because the hot guru was telling neuritis, even in the deafferentiation pain, steroid has the membrane stabilizing action. So all these things, you know, maybe the steroid helped in reducing all these features of the you know, the deafferentiation or similar kind of involvement. Uh, and then when he, when the you know, time was passing on, the pain started coming back. And at that point, what she did was methadone. And as uh, already she has explained nicely and um, uh, Jayashree also told that the methadone is a very unique uh, you know, opioid, which is having the anti-neuropathic action as well. So methadone, you know, when she added, then again the pain uh, went on, you know, uh, reducing, and again it worked. So uh, you know, if we are retrospectively thinking that how these very simple, you know, medications and very simple block work, so then in my opinion, it is the NAR block with steroid, and later on the um, methadone, which is having, you know, the anti-neuropathic action, uh, really did the tricks. So this is, you know, my analysis of the of this case, how it worked nicely. Uh, one thing, Gautam, I don't know what your thoughts are. Uh, sometimes, you know, there are situations where somebody may not be comfortable doing sphenopalatine block, I mean, with the needle, not just putting lidocaine. Let's not forget that with the given symptoms and what has been done, you can also try a stellate ganglion block. Right, right. That is the one simpler, simpler option. Yeah. Okay. Because ultimately, steel ganglion is, you know, giving all the, you know, sympathetic innervation of the head and neck. Okay. Sir, one thing I want to ask, can I ask? Please. Uh, this oral methadone, uh, how long can I continue with this? 
George uh, Sidney is a awesome grandson. He sees using it today. They are using it. <laughs> See, I even though I prescribe minimal amounts of opioids, I have seen patients in my practice who have been in methadone, oxycontin, oxycodone, morphine for 25 to 30 years. Oh. Okay. Yes. So generally the rule of thumb, just for people, that doesn't mean I want any of you to prescribe that way. The rule of thumb with any opioid is with especially methadone, okay? okay. You mm -hmm. never increase your dose more than five milligrams at a time, okay? Yes. So, yes. and you have to wait one week before you jump the dose. Yes. If you feel your patient is in pain, the patient is in the hospital where you are supervising, then also don't jump the dose. Give yes. them something else IV. You have to be very, very careful. Secondly, yes. with methadone, because of the drug-drug interaction, I would never prescribe it to a patient unless I knew the patient a little bit because I tell them about the drug-drug interaction and I tell them, hey, if you get an antibiotic, you need to let me know or you need to go do the drug-drug interaction on Google and understand which one will make your medication more effective or less effective. So you need a patient who will have a little bit of understanding. Otherwise, you need to supervise these patients very stringently, especially on methadone. The rule of thumb with any opioid, including methadone, is if you think it is not effective, please wean the patient off. The weaning period may take two to three weeks or four weeks, but there is no point in keeping a patient on an opioid when it is not effective or working. I have seen patients on the same five milligram methadone three times a day with neuropathic pain where they are able to function and there is no need for you to give them 30 or 40 or 20 milligrams when there is no need, okay? Those yes. are the two I wanted to add. And one more question uh, uh, to everybody that uh, if the pain recurs again, uh, do I, uh, can I give the uh, uh, supratrochlear, uh, I mean supraorbital, infraorbital blocks again? I would say there is no harm in doing a diagnostic block provided you feel the pain is in the same area when you treated him before. Okay. And most importantly, these are very simple work, you know, not that invasive. So uh, the, why not to start, try the simpler things first before going to the other invasive, more invasive things. And because yes. it works nicely. So if the pain is recurring back, so I, I, I'll be feeling that, okay, you can increase the methadone dose a little bit and also okay. you can try, the, try the, these simple blocks you know, okay. according to the distribution of the nerve and then okay. uh, see the results. Okay, thank you so much. Right, uh, if there are no other uh, uh, queries from the panelists, uh, quick sum up. So uh, patients with trigeminal neuralgia where we tried conservative management first and then with oral anti-neuropathy pain medication, which did not work, uh, considered surgery, surgery again worked for a period of time, then a couple of hour of ablations and then she presented. Now, um, uh, in terms of managing this patient, yes, uh, she has managed simple things. So simple things working in terms of multimodal, minimal dose, multiple, uh, simple analgesic working is amazing. So as long as it's working at the end of the day, uh, it's fine. So whatever she has done is acceptable, one. Second is... Um, if a simple inter intervention can give you the relief, consider that first instead of going for slightly higher intervention. So that is also acceptable. There is probably not one single way of doing this. There are obviously different ways of doing this. Most of them may be safe. Most of them may be effective in your case. Uh, so you have to uh, prioritize and see what works for your patient in terms of what is his lifestyle or her lifestyle. Uh, affordability and the setting you are working in 
and ultimately make this patient comfortable one second is um in terms of particular management in terms of interventions there is a role for diagnostic sympathetic block uh, that as there is a role for diagnostic sinopalatine there is also a role for a stellate ganglion block uh, so that and also one of the panelists uh, threw up this question of having a technical failure so if you are thinking in terms of technical failure you can if after doing the diagnostic sympathetic block also i think there is a role for doing a diagnostic trigeminal itself and then going up ahead uh, in terms of pharmacology yes so there the i think using opioids either strong or weak is fine so that's not a problem so yes uh, for archana it worked there are multiple ways of doing this so you'll have to do this step by step and uh, seeing the response you'll have to take it further so uh, i would like to congratulate uh, sirish who presented a wonderful case he put all the aspects very thoroughly in good sequence so he did not miss anything so congratulations to him i would like to particularly congratulate archana because uh, she had the guts to come up with that complicated case and manage it in her own way was something that was not there in the textbooks and uh, presented in in front of experts so congratulations to both the speakers so you did a good job so you brought out a good discussion the panel is gave out some very valid points so good job both of you thank you so, sir thank you so um karthik before before ending the uh, reminder that from next saturday we are having the pain brain tournament the quiz competition so the same time saturday next saturday at 5 pm right so the so all the teams might be you know many of the team uh, members and captains are here so uh, please get ready for the next week very very excited you know all are excited about the pain brain tournament starting from the you know and i'll be asking all the you know expert panelists also to be there and give their expert comment about the about the quiz questions and the answers and please interact with the participants right so the pain brain tournament is starting next week at, on saturday at 5 pm so most of you are there in one or the other team including myself so all the other panelists and whoever is attending this uh, are invited to attend uh, the pain brain tournament from saturday starting from saturday next saturday 5 pm onwards i uh, will tell you the details of the meeting uh, next week so be ready for that so thank you yes, to sir. all the both the speakers thank you to all the panelists for joining us thank you to all the delegates thanks to dardia uh, for arranging this and dr das for bringing us all together so thank you very much uh, have a nice weekend stay safe and see you all and, next uh, thank you very much thank you so much very nice moderation all throughout all, every session so was so interesting because of your very nice moderation thank you thank you uh <laughs> thank dr you, das uh, this is dr al khabir from dr gadir from sudan i'm sorry that i am joining the meeting too late because of our situation you see we have problems with network so i joined late so i actually read the cases that has been sent yesterday it was very nice cases so i joined i as well the the trigeminal management so i think uh, this is one of the problem it should be uh, my suggestion to do some research is on the failure of radio frequency as you know we have a lot of cases so of when we did the radio frequency there is some failure is happening after the radio frequency uh, so we have to clear this by some researches on that and uh, thank you for the presenters and i'm sorry for joining late uh, the meeting thank you sir. thank you thank you dr gadir so thank you everyone so see you again next week thank you thank you so much thank you bye. so much thank you take care stay safe bye bye thank you jai shri ma'am hi <laughs>